So this is a picture of London I took back in 1976 when the uh, sun last shone here. Now, two-stage revision ACL is really unattractive to the patient. It's usually three to six months between the two stages. And if you're a professional athlete, that may actually mean that you lose another season. For, that, for them, that could be career ending. It's more expensive, there's more morbidity. And I suspect a lot of surgeons do two-stage procedures as a reflex decision. They don't really consider whether a one-stage is possible. Now, of course, the truth is I do do two-stage procedures. I've even published on it. In this example on the right, you can see a huge defect in the tibia. The only answer here is a bone grafting first stage and a second stage revision. But the truth is I do very, very few two-stage procedures. If you look at my series of 204 patients in that um, time period from 09 to 17, only three of them were two-stage. So you've got to realize my practice is really unusual. And you could say that this is a, a very dangerous talk. But at the end, I will present my data on results because I felt duty bound when I realized how unusual my practice was to check it out. Now, these are the prerequisites for getting a good result for any reconstruction, uh, primary or revision. You need a good graft. You've got to put it in the right place. You've got to fix it properly. And then you've got to think about how you minimize the stresses. Now, if you've got a posterior slope that's high in a primary setting, you probably wouldn't do an osteotomy, but then you might add a tenodesis to try and offset that increased risk. And there are various options you can see listed here and Dinshaw covered most of those. When you plan for a revision procedure, you've got to work out why the primary case failed because you don't want to repeat mistakes. And you've also got to think about the previous graft type. Patella tendon is a great graft to revise because the bone blocks mean that you rarely have problems with loss of bone, whereas soft tissue grafts can be more problematic. You've got to look at the fixation devices, the type of them, where they are, whether you can you should remove them, whether you can ignore them if they're too far out of the way, which is, it makes life easy. If they're absorbable, of course, you can drill through them, but you do scatter debris. And there is some thought that maybe that's a reason for tunnel widening in revision cases uh, if you've done that. Uh, you need to assess the previous tunnel size and position and I'd always get an, a CT scan prior to surgery and then you've got to choose your graft. Over the last 10-15 years I've been using that algorithm that I've uh, created and hopefully we'll have this uh, published in print very shortly. We've got a paper being reviewed at one of the big journals at the moment. And so there's a thought, a thought process which I like to apply. So the first thing is about graft choice. An autograft is far superior to allograft. You can see the big increase in failure rate of nearly three times for the Mars group. And so I really don't like using allograft unless I've got no other option. <clears throat> and with various tricks that I'll show you, you can cope with a tunnel up to 20 millimeters diameter if you use um, bone blocks on a quad tendon or a patella tendon. Those blocks are square, so you've got the square peg in a round hole phenomenon. And you can also use large metal screws that can fill a void. Uh, hamstrings can be uh, tripled or quadrupled, and you can deal with a tunnel probably up to 17 millimeters with those, particularly combined with a, an interference fit screw. Allograft is attractive because you don't have to harvest, and also the bulk of the graft is big. But as I said, I, the failure rate is too much for my liking. I always add a tenodesis in every revision case. Now, there are various scenarios to deal with. First of all, the tunnels are nowhere near okay. Some of those ones that Dinshaw sh showed would be easy revisions, it'd be like a primary reconstruction, and you just create new tunnels. But do what, think about graph size. If you have a big graft, you have a big tunnel, and that'll get you closer to the original tunnel, and you may get conflict. So you don't want to overdo it. Obviously, you need a minimum size, and certainly in our patients in the West, a minimum of eight millimeters diameter for hamstrings would be what I wanted. If the fixation devices are out of the way, there's no need to remove them. So you can bypass them, it's quite simple. So this is a win. Another win is where the previous surgeon did a great job and the tunnels haven't widened. You can reuse those tunnels. Uh, there you've got to make sure you clear the soft tissue properly and you've got to make sure that you get bleeding bone in the tunnels by decorticating them using a curette or a microfracture pick to create bleeding. Now we get into the difficult scenario, the first of the two difficult ones. What about very widened tunnels? Well, you can use a big graft, and we've talked about multi-strand hamstrings. You can use the bone blocks on a patella tendon or quad tendon. 
you could use allograft. The only downside of a very big graft is the risk of uh, impingement in the notch. And so notch plasty becomes regularly required for this. You can use large metal screws to fill voids and you can use those screws to push the graft eccentrically within a large tunnel to the position you want. Occasionally, I'll do an acute allograft bone dial grafting and then drill through those, gra those grafts in a one stage procedure. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And never forget on the femoral side, the over the top position is a good option. And really it's the tibia that's the problem. So here's a professional rugby league player who's had three previous ACLs in this knee and he's coming towards the end of his career and he will not have a two-stage procedure. He just says he can't cope with he needs another contract. So I looked at the axial and I thought, well, it looks like there's three separate drill holes here that come. And I was able to fill those two anterior ones with bone graft and then use the posterior uh, as my new tunnel. So here is his knee. I've taken a big teletendon graft and uh, I've got these bone dowels into press fit. I've held them with K wires, transfixed them into the joint, and you can just see the tip of the K wire here. And then I've, with a guide wire, very, very gently drilled up to get a new tunnel. And then I've pulled my graft in. And then when I'm happy with it, I've fixed it. Screw is sat in the front, pushing the graft back to where it needs to be so it doesn't impinge and then bone graft either side, filling that, those anterior chambers. And so if, you, if you're really rigorous with your surgical technique, you can get great results. This guy played at nine months post-surgery, so it saved his career and he got a new contract. What about this option? Because this is uh, also problematic. The tunnels are good, but they're just not right. What are you going to do? Well, one option is to use the same tunnel, but deliberately move the center of that tunnel by reaming eccentrically. Now, the price of that, of course, is an increased tunnel diameter, but you can fill that space with a large graft or, and or a metal screw, pushing it where you want it. Again, the rectangular bone blocks from quad tendon to tendon have a, a square peg and a round hole effect. And on the femoral side, you can still use the over the top position. So again, it's the tibia that's the issue. So I'll take you through the tibial tunnel scenarios. What about the excessively anterior tunnel? We'll obviously get notch against graft impingement, the, the graft fails. This is an easy situation. You just ream posteriorly, so you create a bigger tunnel, and then you, the graft will be against the back wall of the tunnel, and you place a large anterior screw to fill that void. The real problem is when the tunnel is too posterior, which creates the vertical graft that Dinshaw showed. <coughs> if it's more than 10 millimeters excessively back, that's not too difficult. Just to drill a completely new tunnel, and as long as your graft isn't too big, it won't conflict with the other tunnel. The big problem is when you've got an excessively uh, posterior graft that's um, more than 10 millimeters posterior, uh, sorry, less than 10 millimeters posterior. What are you going to do then? Well, if you ream anteriorly and try and get your graft to sit at the front, as soon as you bend the knee, the graft will fall backwards. So that's not going to work. You could use a very long screw, but the problem is the graft's going to impinge against the tip of the screw abrade and fail. So maybe this is a case where we should consider a two-stage procedure or possibly use acute bone grafting as I showed you earlier on. Fixation is very important. I frequently use double fixation. So on the tibial side, I use an interference screw, plus I take the sutures from the graft and the, around a posting screw or a suture anchor. On the femoral side, I always have an interference screw to, to push the graft where I want it. If it's a soft tissue graft, I use an ender button. If it's a patella tendon or quad tendon, I'll take the sutures up around the staple I use for my Macintosh tenodesis. So you need a stable graft for healing. My experience uh, is shown here. We've looked at this seven year period, 94 cases and 93 patients from my private practice. And nearly half of these were my, from my elite athlete population. I was the primary surgeon in just over a quarter. And in one in five, this was a second or subsequent revision. So quite a difficult group. And most of them are male, as you expect. Soccer and rugby were the main um, sports. And we looked at fairly crude outcome in terms of whether the graph survived or failed and had to be revised, whether and what their um, patient um, the, the problems were, the patient uh, reported outcomes. And also if they were athletes, how long it took to get back. 
And we got 100% follow up on these guys, a minimum of two years, mean of 4.3. And uh, 90% of these have meniscal and condyl damage at the revision procedure. And it's a pretty badly injured knees. <coughs> four were, uh, four unfortunately re ruptured. So that's a 4.3% failure rate occurring at a mean of 1.6 years. 25% uh, nearly had to have further procedures. So it's, it's hard work, this. Uh, mainly it's simple things like meniscectomy or removal of metal, thankfully. One of them got infected, but in fact, it was the adjacent osteotomy that got infected, and thankfully that cleared by removing the plate because it already united. So we got away with that one. Now, the reason I did this study was because I knew that my practice is very unusual and I didn't want to be irresponsible. I need to look after my patients. And as you can see, the results for Tegner and Coos were actually very good and very comparative to all other series of revision ACLs. So that's very reassuring. And what that tells us is that if you're really rigorous with your planning, assessment of the patients, and you really make sure your surgery is perfect, you, only a minority of revision ACLs need to be done in two stages. Um, I've got an important disclosure amongst my four disclosures here, and that is that I'm a shareholder and a board member of Innovate Orthopedics, a small startup that makes metal interference screws. I've got a strong bias to metal, I can explain another time, but <clears throat> um, that is puts me at conflict with, with this talk. Thank you very much.